because I have the dubious um, honour of being the convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. It's a committee that MSPs only ever want to come to once, which is when they want to sell us a cross-party group. If they come a second time, it is sometimes because the independent commissioner has found that they may have erred in some of their actions and they come to us. And that in itself is an interesting part of the core of what our discussion this afternoon about our standards in public life really declining, um, about who watches the watchers, who governs the governed, who should judge those that come before. And we may well get to that. But can I welcome you all um, to this festival of politics and also to the Scottish Parliament, which has the privilege of being 25 years old this year. And indeed, the festival is in hot pursuit because this is the 20th year um, of the festival. And I would like to thank the University of Stirling, who is our co-sponsors for this afternoon. And in due course, uh, those who've been to these will know how it goes. I will be inviting comments, um, questions, hopefully factually, hopefully short, so we can get a lot in from you, the audience, because this is a very much a two-way uh, event because with my convener's hat. I'm desperate actually to find out what lots of people think about standards, but also with a politician's hat on. It's also nice to hear those who have to do the voting. Um, we are on the wonderful world of social media with at visit Scott Paul and also on Instagram. So if you can't wait to contribute, I don't mind if you pull your phones out and pop something on there. It will be observed and I may make reference to it um, so be careful what you say. I'd also um, like to introduce and say a massive thank you to Shona Dixon and Jenny Laird, who are sitting at the side um, and are our two BSL interpreters for this afternoon. And you'll be able to watch yourself on the Scottish Parliament YouTube channel afterwards. It is actually being broadcast now. Um, so there are many, many people watching on. So, without further ado, can I'd like to introduce our panel, uh, which is Dr. Ian Kaywood here, Philip Rycroft and Dr. Elizabeth Luce, or Ellie Luce, I think you'd be happy with. Um, so, Ian is Associate Professor of Modern British Political and Religious History at the University of Stirling, our co-sponsors, is the author of, quote, The Many Lives of Corruption, and I was just saying, it's a fascinating choice of a title for a book, <laughs> The Many Lives of Corruption. Um, and that covers 1750 to 1950. So those who have questions of the past, we have the latter half of uh, two books that can be covered. Um, Philip is probably one of the most, civil most famous civil servants um, of all time, based in Scotland and London. And I am going to say this, worked for over 30 years and drifted across to the European Commission for, for a stage as well, um, and is now non-executive director, academic and consultant, a non-executive director um, at Edinburgh University and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at Cambridge University, and is one of the names that occasionally politicians, when they see them coming up on witness panels in front of various committees, most recently, I think in March, the House of Lords sends a little shiver through because he knows. Um, and finally, Dr. Ellie Luce, um, who joins us from the John Smith Centre, which she started with only a few months ago. Um, and she is the Research and External Engagement Officer. And it's about empowering young people to engage uh, in and to enter British politics. And one of the great challenges that young people have, as women have, is when you see what this appears to be like from a social media, from a press, indeed from neighbours and people sometimes in your street, the idea that anyone would voluntarily want to get into it um, is quite an incredible thought. But I know Ellie and indeed the John Smith Centre are doing huge amounts of work to bring that down. She is also an expert on spaghetti. So if you have a different and related question, it's a small world. <laughs> and that's it. So um, I'm going to set the scene by asking our panellists a few questions just to delve into. And then at the end of those questions, I will be opening up um, for questions. So if you want to make notes and things, I've got no problem with that. Um, my task will be to keep them on time, keep myself on time and actually uh, drive this forward. So if it gets really bad, you can yawn. Actually, if you want more, um, you can applaud and say how they want. But 
I think we really need to kick off by setting the scene about what we mean. Um, and that leads to the first question that all undergraduates ask, that um, all politicians ask themselves, which, have we actually seen a decline in the standards of public life in recent years? And what is the evidence to say that's occurred? Um, Ellie, I'm going to start at the far end and work towards. So, um, so yeah, thank you uh, for having us, Martin. Um, I think that it's obviously a very broad question, and the very first thing we need to ask ourselves is what do we mean by standards in public life? That's, it could be potentially a very subjective question that everybody might answer quite differently. Um, but the thing that we specifically look at that I would um, take guidance from as are the standards of public life, as also known as the Nolan Principles. There are seven principles that are more or less defined for uh, public office holders. Uh, they include accountability, integrity, leadership, honesty, openness, objectiveness, and selflessness. Um, and so that they kind of give us a good guideline and something to start with, but they are quite hard to measure. It is quite hard to say this is the amount of uh, uh, percentage that people in public office and all of public office are accountable or not or are uh, good leaders or not. So it's, it's quite a hard thing to, to grasp. Um, what we do at the John Smith Centre is that we specifically focus on trust. Um, so that's obviously something that probably those of you who follow news will have seen in the last few months crop up quite, um, quite significantly that trust in politics and politicians is declining. Um, now, again, at the John Smith Centre, we would say be careful how you talk about trust, right? It's so complex and it's unequal depending on who, um, who who's looking at politicians, you know, depending on your own demographic, on your own situation, you might look at people very differently. Your trust levels might be quite differently depending on your own, even just personal disposition. Um, it's, it's very quite hard uh, to measure that. However, people have tried. There are a lot of polls. Uh, there are a lot of uh, reports that look at these things and um, specifically at different aspects of politics. So, for example, when we look at the Ipsos Vivacity Index, that some people might have heard of, it measures trust in different professions, um, judges, police, doctors. Um, they've done so for over 40 years. Now, politicians in 2023 have come out with 9% of trust. That's the lowest of the professions. Government ministers, 10%. Uh, so we need to take into account for all the numbers, they are from 2023. This is obviously, we've now had a change in government, so there might be a slight change in those numbers, so they have to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but those numbers are really quite low. However, when we look at uh, other stats from the Office for National Statistics, so for example, they say that, um, or they, they show that uh, parties are trusted with 12%, parliament 24%, UK government 27%, and then when we look at the um, social, uh, Scotland Social Attitudes Survey, it's 47% for the Scottish Government, which is obviously uh, quite a bit higher than what we've seen for other numbers. Um, but for all of these, I should say as well, they have declined. So numbers from the previous iterations of these reports were all higher. And they've, it's, some of them have declined quite significantly between 8 or 10% point within one year. So that is, I would say, quite a significant um, um, aspect of uh, uh, decline in those um, Number. So when we look at that, and that's probably more a perception of if standards have declined than the actual standards, but there's at least a perception that people are trusting their politicians less, are trusting their institutions less, and we can infer from that 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 also includes standards and how politics, uh, politicians observe those Nolan principles that we've talked about. Excellent. Thank you. Philip, do you want to...? Uh, thanks, Martin. <coughs> thanks for having me along. Um, so I'll come at this from those 30 years that you spoke about, which um, ended uh, on March 29th, 2019, which some of you will recall was meant to be a significant date, the date that we were meant to leave the European Union when I was looking after the Brexit department, and it, just to prove that I could manage one exit, I exited myself from the government at that time. Um, so over those 30 years, uh, I, I, I don't have the evidence, that, you know, I don't have an evidence base, this is my personal experience, but... Over those 30 years, I can say across the wider public sector, judiciary, police, civil service itself, local government, um, if you include in the business community, the professions more broadly, I would say unequivocally we have not seen a decline in, pub in standards in public life. Uh, I would say, to con uh, contrary to that, I would say there's probably some evidence there of an increase certainly, of expectations, and I think the various actors in that space have responded to it. But I think what most people will be interested in is actually the political side 
and again, to, just to sort of stir the pot slightly there, I've worked with politicians at a senior level from four political parties. Um, by definition, I can't have agreed with all of the politics of those politicians, but what I can say to a man and a woman pretty much universally, these were people of high personal integrity, of probity in, in the service of, of, of the public interest, um, who were committed to improving the common weal. Um, and that was, I say, my personal experience, um, and across this, mostly ministers, clearly, so people who've worked their way up um, the chain, but also encountered a lot of other politicians the course of that. Uh, and very few of them, uh, to my mind, have not lived up to the standards expected of them. Uh, this country, I do not believe, is systemically corrupt. Uh, I think, by and large, public life in this country proceeds in a way that does respect um, the Nolan standards uh, and is internationally of a pretty high standard. I am, however, aware that there are two challenges to my thesis. One is more proximate, uh, which is the experience of the Johnson-led government uh, after I left the civil service, but nevertheless, obviously, uh, very pertinent. What happened there, and I think there is an interesting discussion there to be had uh, about what happened and why through that administration, because I have no doubt in that time, uh, from the world as I see it, which is largely through the lens of constitutional uh, and governance issues, there was a collapse in governance standards. So what happened there and why? Is that an aberration or is it a portent of something to come in that we should discuss that? But the second deeper and more profound issue is the one that Ellie's described, is that there is a perception uh, that standards in public life are slipping, not least uh, of, of politicians. And that in itself is very destructive of people's confidence in the democratic infrastructure and ultimately in the political process. Uh, and that is concerning and worrying, uh, and those who have some influence over this, it seems to me, need to be cognizant of that and do what they can in their power to address that. I think that ultimately uh, is one of the most important issues that the political world faces um, in 2024. Thank you. Take maybe a slightly wider look. Ian. Um, well, perhaps I could ask the audience this question. Um, it's always nice to get this. I always start off when I'm talking about standards and corruption with my students. This question, in, in answer to, to what our colleagues have both said, how many people here have been asked to pay a bribe in order to access um, some service? Frankly, Precise. Oh, one person. One person. Thank you. Not in the UK, yes. Well, that, in a sense, confirms that certainly at the peripheral level, or rather, dare I say, at the, uh, the provincial level, at the level where public services encounter uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the individual, the state, um, the paying of the bribe is almost something that we, our parents, our grandparents, find completely, not only abhorrent, but just completely, we're just not familiar with the concept. Now, let's bear in mind that in most countries of the world... Uh, and not, I'm not trying to be neo-colonial about this, um, quite a few European countries, that is not the common experience. In order to access the best schools, in order to access healthcare, in order to jump queues, in, you could argue that we have a private healthcare and a private health system, and therefore you might, but in terms of the services that most of us use, we don't pay bribes. So let's bear in mind, geographically, we are quite unique. Historically, we are almost completely unique. We shouldn't be asking the question, have standards slips? We should be asking the question of, how on earth did we end up with decent standards in the first place? Because historically and geographically, that is not a common experience. It's become the expectation. It's become, as political scientists would call it, the norm. But it's a very fragile norm, and I think um, Philip's point about how quickly um, standards declined... Uh, in the last um, five years um, illustrates just how fragile it really is. Let's bear in mind that, like fish, standards rot from the head, right? And that was the danger of the last five years of the Johnson administration. Uh, and that's one of the few occasions that I, as an academic, stuck my head over the parapet and wrote an article for The Conversation saying we need to be very worried about this. But in my comment on that article, I did make the point that many of the features that created the high standards of public life that Philip's described 
and that we all enjoy have actually started to disappear within the, the political sphere. Uh, one of those is the, the calibre and the expectation that, that the best people will enter public life. Partly it's to do with attitudes towards what public services should provide and their relationship with private interests. But it's also, of course, to do with the, the safeguards, the, the guards. It's particularly to do with the decline of the independent press. That is a very important feature of the 19th century in exposing poor standards of public conduct and how much of what went on in the Johnson administration was not exposed, how much of it was hidden. Well, we don't know, do we? Because that's been hidden. But that's one of those dangers that we face. So let's bear in mind that the standards that we enjoy today are somewhat unique, but let's also bear in mind that they are very fragile. Thank you. And it is interesting that um, mentioning there of, of, of the independent press, which has arisen in an, a number of conversations at this festival, as one of the counterbalances, one of the protectors that exists. Um, and as we've seen, particularly um, local regional newspapers fall, and now potentially um, broadsheets and others fall or move online, that one of the aspects that we have to hold and counterbalance is, is, is weakening. Um, so how do we think the, the sort of the political, and I'm, I'm thinking particularly in Scotland, but I realise we, we'll have to, to, to go wider than that. So, you know, what are the political, the social, the, the cultural changes that have taken place over, and I'm going to randomly choose 25 years because obviously it's the anniversary of the Parliament, over the last 25 years impacted on the standards. So we've talked about the figures showing that there is a decline. We've talked about single one-off events where clearly... Um, there is very, very strong argument to say there is a point of decline. Are there any other aspects of our life um, that have impacted on the standards in public life? Um, and what do you think those specific changes are? I'm going to start the far end again, <laughs> Nelly. <laughs> um, so I think... Positive and negative. Let's see if we can find some positive <laughs> improvements, that would be good as well. We'll try. <laughs> Um, so I, I think the question you definitely framed in a good way in that, you know, there are different aspects that play into our understanding of standards in public life and our trust in our politicians. It's not just actual political aspects, the economy plays a part, culture plays a part, social aspects play a part. Um, so and just to highlight some, and I think um, we probably can all agree that the, especially the last 10 years have been have been quite difficult um, with COVID, with the uh, cost of living crisis. Um, and these are not necessarily events that the government was able to, to prevent, but obviously there's, there's a, a reasonable expectation there that, they, that the government is in charge of helping people get through these crises and make things better. Um, but if we look at some of the uh, indications that really, really influence people's trust in their politics and their institutions and their systems, um, they have declined. So, for example, um, quite significantly, people who are financially struggling are much, much more likely to distrust their politicians than those who are well-off. Similarly, those who are dissatisfied with the NHS are 20% more likely to think that the governing system needs improvement. And that's 86%, by the way. So even those, those who are happy with the NHS, still 65% of them think the government system needs improving, so that's still a majority of the people. So these numbers are staggering, and um, they they just it signify that there's a, there's a bigger trend for, and that economic um, reasons actually play a massive part in how people trust their politi politi politicians, their institutions, which you know who have been instated to facilitate public life and to, to help people <laughs> lead better lives. Um, culturally, we've uh, you know we've seen especially in the last. Is it 20 years, the rise of social media, 10, 15 years? Um, and as we all know, um, that you know, has brought a whole host of challenges as much as social media is um, supposed to connect us. Um, it also does a whole lot of other things, uh, such as misinformation, polarizing, um, these kind of aspects. And they massively add to what we just said about the perception of the standards of public life declining. Because um, you, really, you can't really get away from political news, even if you want to, right? It's, it's just everywhere. Um, so something that might not be as big as it is might be shown to you as it's constant. It's always there. Um, so social media, again, a massive, massive role in that. Um, but we also see, I think, a bit of a, on a broader level, 
Um, we hear about an epidemic of loneliness. We hear about communities, social fabric of communities not being as tight-knit as it used to be. Um, and those, those kind of general trends also contribute to people's trust in general and people around them, but also, again, in their politicians can't maybe really relate to the politicians anymore. You feel like this person is not, they don't represent me. Um, this is a bit, seem to be like a, a different type of people almost who don't play by the same rules that I have to play by. And that, again, that perception really contributes to that low trust. So and I, I just pick into that a little yeah. bit. Is, is standards the full guy for this change? Or is actually the change highlighting the challenge that there are with standards, the them and us, the they have a different experience, you can't relate. There is a, an income, a health, um, a loneliness, a, a friendship group challenge that people are looking to standards as the shorthand explanation. Or do you think that perhaps actually the level of expectation of individuals who come into politics, who come into the civil service, who come into public service is lower than perhaps it was? A tricky question. I'll go back to you. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Um, I don't think there's a clear cut answer just because these topics are so complex and everything plays into each other, right? Um, so I, I wouldn't say that standards and public lives are taking the fall for other developments, but they're certainly part of it, I would think. Um, sorry, that's just off the top of my head. But so is it more a facet of actually where the challenges occur? We're seeing it in standards. But actually, that is a shorthand for really much deeper challenges that need to be faced. It's the canary in the, in, in the mine, almost, saying this, the alarm bell is going here, but you need to look deeper towards it. Would that I be think fairer? so, yeah. Because especially when we're, looking, you know, when we're looking beyond our own borders, we see trends like this happen all over the place. It's not just the UK that's struggling with, with low trust issues. There's literally in every... Um, the, not every country in the world, I don't know this, but uh, lots of countries, especially Western countries, they all struggle with trust in their government and their established parties. Um, loneliness is not just an issue for the UK. Um, social media is are certainly not just an issue for the UK. So I think these are definitely developments that are more globally spread out. Um, however, how we deal with them is obviously something that we need to address as who we are as, uh, within the Scottish Parliament or uh, British Parliament. Um, just to finish my previous thought around, um, again, then also, so we've had economic and cultural reasons, but obviously political <laughs> reasons play a, a massive part as well. Um, just one, uh, uh, one number that I read uh, in preparation for this panel that really struck me was the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards Office. They received 5,600 complaints about MP behaviour in 22-23. The year before, it was 1,400. There's a massive increase in, in complaints around uh, uh, behaviours that MP have, MPs have uh, exhibit. Now, I don't know if that all refers to the same case, right? I, like, there was no breakdown on how many of these behaviours are uh, directed to the same MP or, or, or different, different MPs. But it just goes to show that kind of what, um, Philip, what you said, uh, around especially the last five to ten years of Boris Johnson administration, there were a lot of scandals happening and a lot of a lot of that really that sentiment that the rules that apply to us, us as the the, 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 the citizens general general, the average citizen, do not apply to politicians. I mean we have party gate. There's so much happening, especially around COVID, that just just took the trust away. It's just that even that, that perception, even if it you know you, I think you were saying lots of people are very integer, int have a lot of integrity. Um, and, you know, you have, you have more than 600 MPs. Of course, not all of them are going to be corrupt. Of course, they're going to be people who are, who are, most of them probably, I don't know, but likely, are very upstanding and really hardworking people who really want to make a change. But it is those few who, who do mess up, um, to say it nicely. Um, um, that you know uh, that causes a problem, and then again, with that being observed as much in the media as it has, and in social media, that creates that perception that we have we are seeing that decline. Thank you. Yeah, to, uh, to, that, to pick off where Ali's left off, I think um, that whole question of exposure, I think, is is absolutely opposite. That what goes on previously a little bit behind closed doors is now out there in in the public and, and gets oxygen very very quickly through social media. Um, and I think that combined with a deeper social trend, which is the sort of the 
uh, the loss of deference for, for those who, you know, in, in time gone by, people would have had an innate respect for. And that's not a bad thing in many ways. People are more challenging. And the positive side of that coin is I think people's expectations have gone up of what they expect of their public servants, I think rightly so. So just to illustrate that, you take something like the expenses scandal. Do you remember the expenses scandal? Where there was a sort of an, a mechanism, basically to try and boost the remuneration of MPs because their, their wage that they got that, that sort of on the, in the pay packet was obviously not sufficient. But politicians weren't brave enough to say, actually, we need to increase your wage because you're doing a difficult job. We need to attract good people and all the rest of it. So they had this sort of site subterfuge. You sort of, the quite a generous expe expense. So that was exposed. People were outraged by it. And it was a, there you see the political world, in a sense, lagging behind mm -hmm. public expectation, and they got caught out. You see it in repeated sacks, um, scandals about lobbying, MPs setting jobs, party funding. The world, you know, when you, th you take a little look at party funding, you think, my God. Why are these people able to donate such huge sums of money? What do they get in return? It's a very obvious question to ask. And the reason I was involved in some of the work on party, party funding in the coalition time, and the reason it's so difficult, um, uh, uh, part of the reason it's so, so difficult to change that is the, the, the way that the, uh, the parties are locked in to the system of funding. They daren't go to you, the public, and say, actually, it would be better if political parties got more public money, more transparent, and individual donations were limited to, say, sake of argument, £10,000. So if you had a mass movement, you could get more money in, but you can't rely on individuals giving many millions of pounds with all, all that comes in the wake of that. So again, the politicians, I think, are behind the curve because they're not brave enough um, to take on these issues and to suggest the obvious solutions because that involves... Uh, a discourse with the public that they think the public might not be ready uh, to wear. So expectations have gone up, which is, I think is a, is a good thing, and that is, is, is the, the political world in response to that has lagged on some of these really key issues. But I think one other thing, just to pick out, which Elliot again touched on, and I think this is really, really important, and that is a sense of disenfranchisement across many communities across the UK, where the political process has become or is seen to be irrelevant to their lives. Um, uh, the, the political engagement at local level is attenuated um, in many parts of the country, maybe reviving a bit now, but certainly that was true, I think, through a lot of the, of, of the, of the early part of the century. Uh, and people sense that the political process is distant from them, they have no influence over it, they have no agency in the political process. And inevitably then, when a scandal breaks, they tend to tar everybody with that same brush because uh, we don't understand these people, we don't see them, we don't know them, and we hear a story that is, is uh, mediated through social media and indeed uh, the print press, uh, and that then allows them to equate uh, those misdemeanours with the whole political class. So uh, just to give a clue as to something I'll say later on in terms of what, how do you deal with this, there is something about how people to relate to power and where that power is held. It's no surprise that trust in the Scottish Parliament in Scotland is higher than trust in Westminster because the Scottish Parliament is closer uh, to people in Scotland. Westminster is the other, it's a long way away. Devolving power as close as you can to the communities that uh, need to influence the exercise of that power is, it seems to me, one very important way of re-engaging people in the political process. Uh, and there's a story to tell on that, not just south of the border, which is probably the most centralised polity, talking about England uh, in the developed world, but also in Scotland, where you've seen the sucking up, sucking up of power from uh, agencies around uh, 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 the country <coughs> to this place in the Scottish Government, and I think that's a retrograde step. And that always allows me to uh, mention J.P. McIntosh, uh, one of my great heroes, who talks about actually putting power as close to the people who are affected by it, um, which resonated with Donald Dewey and appears on, on uh, the entrance to one of, one of, the, room, one of the rooms here. Um, Ian, what do you think about those sort of you know, political, social, cultural changes in the last 25 years, or is well, that too the, close? You say the last 25 <laughs> years, of course, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, as a good historian, I'd have to say that's not my period. Um, 
uh, just coming back to what Philip says, um, just to make a point about this, let's be honest, wh why is Parliament where it is? What are the cultural factors acting on Parliament? Well, let's just think about why Parliament is where it is. I mean, who lives in Westminster? Well, nobody lives in Westminster, do they? But what's in Westminster? Headquarters of the Church of England, headquarters of the Royal Family, and most importantly, headquarters of the City of London. That's why it's there. Those are the forces, those are the influences that act, and that is why it is distance, because fundamentally those are the people who have always had some influence over the institution itself. Let's be honest, Westminster is an 18th century institution, right? The privilege, OK? There's a bar downstairs, right? I don't think it's subsidised, it's very small. How many bars are there in the Palace of Westminster? I'm sorry, if we were at workplace, if I was at the university, OK, we do have a bar, but that's where the students go. <laughs> if I was at school, I remember what um, 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 Fabricant said, you know, during the COVID uh, party gate issue, when he was asked, well, don't all teachers and nurses, after having a busy day, go to the bar and have a drink? Uh, no, we'd be sacked, <laughs> right? So I think the problem is, is... As, as Philip rather gave the game away there, we have 360 MPs, some of them won't be good. Sorry, sorry, no, no. If you were at a professional institution, if you were a teacher, and you would, be, you would be sacked. If you didn't reach the standards required of you as an engineer, professional bodies would come in and force you to leave. That does not take place within Parliament. It is an 18th century institution that is fundamentally based on the principle of patronage, OK? And we need to think about ways of minimising that patronage, and I quite agree with Philip, devolving authority and power elsewhere. Parliament itself as an institution still has some of the lowest levels of professional expectation and standards of any legislature around. You, can, you have to declare an interest. In America, you have to give your bank statements in. Registers of interests being uh, disbarred from taking part in certain debates, far more rigorously applied in other institutions. Other countries, they do have state funding. You know, Too often Britain gets away with what it does by its failure to look at how other institutions in other countries have evolved. But I don't really want to talk about Parliament, because if you want to talk about the last 25 years, I'll give you my story of when... Um, well, it wasn't I who said it, it was Eric Pickles, who's in charge of one of the bodies... Um, uh, that deals with standards about subsequent employment of politicians and civil servants. And he said his eyebrows shot up. And this is Eric Pickles, not a man famous for having, you know, being easily shocked by poor standards. And what was it that shocked him? It was the information that he discovered that not only had Lex Greensill an office in 10 Downing Street but that the Chief Procurement Officer, Bill Crowthers, was simultaneously for six months working for Greensill, a private individual, while simultaneously working for the civil service. And, just to prove that this is not purely partisan, that was signed off and approved by none other than Sue Gray. <laughs> now, that is shocking. That not Politicians, as I'm saying, they're based on patronage. It's based on one chap at the top and it's usually a chap, handing out gifts to the others. That's an 18th century model of patronage, right? You can try and limit it, but fundamentally the only limit on it is the personal ethical restraint of the person at the top. And, of course, rather beautifully, we had a Prime Minister who had absolutely no personal ethical constraints, and therefore we saw the system in its true colours. So the Greensill scandal was the thing that shocked me, that the culture of entitlement and the connection between government and private interests has actually penetrated right into the heart of the senior civil service. But the reassuring fact was the institution in Westminster actually got rid of Johnson. Let's bear in mind that man had an 80-seat majority. Mm. And by constantly the leader of the opposition, and I don't think we should underestimate Starmer's ability here, here's a man in a minority government, in a party that's divided. <coughs> and week after week, he stood in Parliament and he pointed, not to Johnson, but to the backbenchers. And he said, are you happy with these things going on? Until eventually they weren't. And so Parliament ultimately, just about, having been very provoked, how many scandals were there? Eventually chose to get rid of Johnson.
possibly because they realised how damaged it was with the public, but ultimately the institution proved strong enough to do without him. So actually, in some ways, I'd turn that on its head. Politics proved itself to be more robust than expected to, but the um, bureaucracy didn't. Well, that brings me, I think, to the, the, the part that I hinted at earlier, because one of the aspects of holding to account is the role of media. Um, so, you know, what role should the media play? What role does the media play? And are we weaker if the media, and I will take a very broad definition of media in a changing environment, if that is not doing that job? I'm going to start this side this time, so to, to allow you to go on, Ian, with that. To, since you raised the problem, you raised yeah, who sure, did it, sure, so sure. what role should the media have played and what role should... I'm going to include social media. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, the fact that people could see... Um, the, ca that, the fact the cameras... I mean, let's bear in mind, Parliament resisted broadcasting uh, for as long as it possibly could do um, to try to stop people being able to see what was going on. And when you saw Johnson's face smirking i think that's you know and refusing to and clearly telling lies i think that's when you know both the party and the public that symbiotic relationship of course being part of representative government eventually decided that he he could not be tolerated any longer um but i just obviously as a historian we just have to go back a little bit okay let's bear in mind that parliament came out of a system and still survives as does the Church of England, as does the Corporation of the City of London, as does the royal family, in an age of aristocratic patronage, when effectively, in the post-restoration um, period, um, the aristocracy took control of the state and, and basically misused it. Sinecures, pensions were all used to prop up uh, and benefit um, an elite class, sometimes a group within that, because, of course... It was a spoil system. If the Whigs got in, they appointed all their friends and relations to government jobs. If the Tories got in, they appointed all their friends, which, of course, if anybody knows the American system, might sound awfully familiar. But effectively, what happened is that in that period, the media began to develop. And the media, the press, developed partly as a result of um, ideas um, coming out of the Enlightenment, in which Edinburgh played a very vital and honourable role, uh, partly, of course, about the spread of literacy. Again, Scotland had one of the most literate populations of the time. And, of course, one of the most crucial publications in exposing the corruption of the um, system, of the entire culture, uh, was the Edinburgh Review. But there were plenty of others as well. And they exposed the true nature. And a literate audience could read this. When there were campaigns um, against uh, the system, which culminated in the Reform Act, which finally allowed some middle-class people the right to vote, people wore copies of the anti-corruption literature in their hats. That's how powerful the media actually were. You saw Lord Mayors and um, radical weavers waving the pamphlets in the air. That's how powerful the media was. Unfortunately, of course, during the 19th century, that declined. Gradually, large corporations took charge of the media. Large, powerful individuals and groups took control. In most local communities, that's where the misconduct of the local officials, the local workhouse master, the local police chiefs, whatever it was, was usually exposed. But I've discovered a whole series of um, scandals at the end of the 19th century which were not exposed in the media because the local media gradually got controlled by vested interest groups. Brewers... Others started to control the media and control what was reported. The only time you come across these scandals is when, of course, they reach the law courts, right? Usually because somebody is stupid enough to sue the person for libel. And then, of course, it's proved that it's all true, which was usually the giveaway case. And in those circumstances, it suddenly became clear that the media, even by the end of the 19th century, was losing its ability to expose. It was increasingly becoming controlled. So in some ways... What's happened in the 20th century shouldn't come as much of a surprise. It's a process that's been taking place a long time. But there were independent journalists all the time. And, of course, nowadays, publications like The Ferret, uh, Byline Times, I'm sure you've seen some of these nowadays available even in WH Smith's, are attempting to restore a sort of new radical journalism exposing what was going on. So, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that the media is often 
you know, muzzled, because it muzzles itself, because its proprietors muzzle it, and the journalists muzzle it for fear of offending the proprietors. But we also should be relieved that there is still a tradition of radical expose, even today. Sorry, very long answer. No, no, sorry. But Philip, I mean, to that extent, then, what role should media play in the standards in public life, and probably more importantly, how they're perceived? I mean, we go back to, to sort of Ellie's yeah. college, the perception of it. So what role should media play in that? I mean, media has a hugely important role to play. They mediate the story that the public ultimately consumes in one way and another. And I think the... You know, what Ian has, has described as the, uh, the, the weakening of that scrutiny role, I think, is, is really important. I think, I think it, is, it is probably more evident at the local regional level, and a lot of people say in this now that the that local politicians not being held to account because there aren't sufficient number of journalists out there with the time and the resource to chase after the stories and report those in a way that the public pick up. But I think it's also true at a national level... Whether it's all through the proprietors or not, I, I, I don't I want to go there because I don't have evidence on that. But I think certainly there is evidence to suggest that the, there is the the, the, the the big papers, the big titles have cut back on the number of journalists. There are simply fewer folk around to chase these stories in detail. And a lot of this stuff, you can't just do in one sitting. If you've got a whiff of a story, it takes a lot of dedicated time. I think in the UK, particularly a media that does bias in one political direction, like you see the way that the... Um, the the right-wing media is waking up, waking up now to where they can get their attack points in on the um, uh, on the new government. Um, but one of the one of the really interesting things about all of this is it's the sort of loss of political courage in the face of that media. One of the things that I just, uh, if I allow a little personal opinion to sort of intrude into this, You're which, friends. which really <laughs> sort of irritated me a little bit about the, 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 the election campaign come through is the way that the Labour Party allowed itself to just sort of put itself on the hook that was put up there effectively by Mrs Thatcher about this discourse about the size of the state and about tax levels. So saying at the, the off that they weren't going to increase uh, income tax, VAT or national insurance, come on, everybody knows that to address the problems in public service in this country, we're going to have to increase taxes. Everybody knows that. And the way that governments have tended to do it is, again, it's a sort of a subterfuge. You do it by going after... Um, you, you do it by, 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 by not shifting the thresholds. You hope people don't notice by, by sort of slights of hand, which in turn, I think, um, it, it, it cheapens the public discourse. There's a sort of a lack of honesty there. And being up front with people, I remember, well, I'm old enough to remember the days when you get the budget and it was whether income tax went at 1p or 2p in the pound at the time. And we've seen, and I think the, it, it's, okay, the media drives that agenda, a big part of the media drives it, but again, it's the political response to that um, that then allows it to have an impact on the way that, um, uh, that, that public life is, is tr transacted in this country. So both on that and the other one where I think the Labour Party has retreated, actually now behind public opinion, is about the EU and our relationship with the EU. All the opinion polls say now that there's quite a lot of buyer's remorse out there, unsurprisingly, because it was an enterprise that was doomed in some respects, and apologies to the Brexiteers in the room, to fail. I mean, in some respects, it, was, you know, it did the job it said it was doing brought sovereignty home, but economic terms, all sorts of other things. It was, we, everybody who was involved with this knew it was going to uh, create problems, and people have recognised that. But for fear of being tired, we've been against the enterprise. Uh, the party that is now in government, the stonking majority, is running, I think, behind public opinion. And I think part of that is just this inculcated fear of what the Daily Mail is going to say about it. Now, Again, I speak from a lot of experience of this, that sitting with, you know, what's the most important thing a lot of senior politicians look at first thing in the morning? It's the headlines and the print media. Now, just one very final quick word. I think the world is, of course the world has changed dramatically around this, the advent of social media. Yes. And there is, a, there is a very, very vibrant discourse on social media, some of it brilliant, quite a lot of it complete nonsense. But the world as a whole, I don't think, has quite adjusted yet for the social media to replace what the print media was once able to do. We're, are we in a transition? Or are we just into a world 
where it is going to be more chaotic, where we as individual citizens have a greater responsibility to, to, to be educated enough to work our way through that stramash? That, I think, is an unanswered question. I think, Elif, I'd, I'd drags away from the party political, but only because we're supposed to be um, discussing, obviously, standards. If we look to sort of younger generations, Ellie, and we can three of this side of it can clearly say that, uh, and look to you for the answers. Is the consumption of media different for young people, which I think we say would say yes, but how is that going to affect, do you think, the question um, that we're addressing today about the politicians? But, yes, the answer is obviously yes. Young people do consume news and media uh, much differently than, um, you know, buying your broad broadsheet on the corner shop every day. Um, uh, so I, th I think what I was quite interesting is that the difference between your, your s traditional news media and social media, because they both include media, but the point is very, very different of why they were set up to, to be what they are. Um, I think what I've mentioned earlier, social media is, on the face of it, set up to connect people. Um, internally, it's all about making money, and the currency for that is attention. So it's not about monitoring politicians or politics. It's not about... Um, making sure that um, the way policies are formed or the, the way people conduct themselves is correct in, in politics. Um, as I think traditional media, you know, that's its role. It's, it's so important to, uh, uh, to um, expose scandals. For example, Partygate came out because of investigations. The expenses scandal came out because of investigations of, by journalists. So that, in that regard, it's so important and very positive. But then now we have the effect of social media. And social media, as I said, is not actually there to, to provide us with news coverage in that regard, although it does, it definitely does. Um, and as you say, young people, or as you've, you've asked about, young people do consume media differently, not just young people. I think we've got about, uh, about a third, no, the online media and social media are the third highest, um, what's the word? Um, like, like way of consuming media. Nowadays, sorry, um, still I think TV and radio are still a bit higher, um, but lots of people consume media now, uh, news um, online, specifically social media, and especially uh, Twitter and TikTok are right very high up there. And, and we've seen recently what that can do when the information that is spread is not correct, mm -hmm. uh, what effects that can have. Um, now, there are... Um, there are definitely things that we can do, but it, it feels very overwhelming and it's very difficult. Um, and I think the government's proposed, for example, to uh, teach critical, uh, critical thinking in schools, and I do think that's very important. It kind of ties into the point that you've done there about what's our own responsibility in terms of consuming the media, but especially also how do we engage online um, with others. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> um, yeah, as, as another point I wanted to, to, to add to that is that Traditional media is now also more online. Uh, obviously, they're also more on social media. And so and all of a sudden, you also get that attention grabbing that maybe before wasn't quite, you know, when you sold your papers on the street. You still you had to get people's attention, of course. But now it's per article. They can see how many clicks each article get. You know, you get, you get more attention grabbing um, headlines. So the language and the way things are reported has also shifted a bit more towards that kind of attention uh, 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 currency, uh, a bit more aggressive, maybe a bit more, uh, the narratives are slightly, um, yeah, a bit more outrageous uh, to grab more of the attention. Um, so you could, you know, looking forward, you could argue that y you need to be on social media and that's the way to, to win votes, that's, an, that's the way to, to win people. I mean, we've seen this in the current election, uh, lots of uh, reform have gotten a lot of votes and they were most successful on Twitter, um, so, sorry, on TikTok, they've had most followers there, um, most engagement. Um, no, that would be a really sad state of affairs. I would say if all you need to do to win is be the most active on one social media platform. Um, but it's definitely something that we need to consider and think about. Yeah. To pull it back to standards, because I'm going to do the great conveners line, I'm very conscious of time, and actually I do want to very much actually include, include the audience. So I'm, I'm going to pose this question to you, Ian, because it sits bang in your historic uh, expertise, which is... Um, if we look back at the, the Victorian era where we saw significant change or yeah. are taught that we saw significant changes um, in public life, what's the lesson that we should learn from that period? Um, 
about initiating reforms now? Um, of course, the first rule of um, history is that the first lesson of history is that nobody ever learns the lessons of history. Um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, if we knew how to make honest public servants, all public servants would be honest. So it's, it's a cultural process. Um, and as I'm always tempted to say, if you want to improve standards in Britain today, I wouldn't start from here. Okay, <laughs> If we could just go back about 170 years, we might have a chance of improving standards. What is it, of course, if we look at other countries that happened in that period? Um, it was, of course, you know, a cultural transformation. It was the decline in the power of, of the church, the, the belief that, that people were able to make judgments about moral issues for themselves. Um, it was, of course, about the growing power of literacy. It was, of course, about the growth of representative government. But most of all, of course, it was about people's ability to do with more of their lives than just simply basically subsist. So that's fundamentally what happened. The modern age appeared in the 19th century. But if we consider what the alternative to public standards are, which is corruption, which interests me, you know, not why are people honest, but why are people not corrupt... Um, what you actually see in the 19th century is a series of waves of public anger. And that's why I am positive about the anger there was against Boris Johnson, the fact that people didn't just accept it, the fact that there was such anger, even on Conservative backbenchers when he delivered an 80-seat majority. And what happened was a partial transformation. I sometimes call it a conservative revolution. Historians like talking about a liberal revolution, but when you've got an empire in which you're basically exploiting people across the world. I always worried how, how liberal this revolution actually was. Um, the empire, of course, is a little corner where corruption is allowed to carry on completely untouched by what's happening in the metropolis for the whole of the century. But I'm not going to get uh, bogged down by that. I, I've got one country to talk about, which will take me long enough, let alone a quarter of the world. But the point is that in the 1820s and 1830s, a new rising middle class said, this isn't good enough, we need better standards. The transformation that took place was partial, and as I say, Parliament still remains an 18th century institution, and patronage, the power of patronage of the monarch, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lord Mayor of London, who of course is still elected under a medieval franchise, by the way, everybody, um, and of course the Prime Minister, remain unchanged. But in reality, of course, we started to see the creation of new institutions, things like um, workhouses, which have negative connotations, but at least means there's a standardised system of care for all. We, of course, see things like factory inspection, which is one of my uh, great areas of public service you see for the first time. People actually coming in and saying, no, you can't do that to children, which, of course, is uh, rather uncomfortably um, how an awful lot of the clothes we're wearing today are made, but we try not to think about that. But anyway, point being, patronage was challenged in the 1820s. Then in the 1850s, the question of impartiality was raised. How can we ensure our public servants are impartial? The solution to that, which I don't think was the correct solution, which was make sure that they've all received an education at either Oxford or Cambridge University, the consequences of which um, perhaps we, we, I don't want to go into, particularly not with Philip sitting next to me, because I <laughs> might say something I regret. But... The point is, of course, we then ended up with a, a definition of what impartial meant that basically meant, uh, fundamentally, upper-middle-class, aristocratic, elitist education. Bear in mind, in order to get into the civil service, the exam to get into the civil service for the next 75 years was based exactly on the Oxford and Cambridge syllabus. And, of course, even today, graduates of Oxford and Cambridge dominate. And if you think I've got a chip on my shoulder, don't worry, I went to Cambridge myself, so I, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and then in the 1880s, the challenge was, so first of all, the challenge was in patronage. Then the challenge was to create an impartial civil service, both of which partially succeeded. Then we got the challenge to bribery, right? the attempt to limit the ability of civil servants to be bribed by commercial enterprises, what you might think of as a more horizontal version of corruption. Now, that was remarkably successful even though most historians have never studied it. Because, as I suggested, the media didn't tend to cover it because they were worried about this revealing their own commercial interests, the owners of the media. 
An organisation called the uh, Secret Commission's Anti-Bribery League exposed a major corruption in one of the biggest public services in Britain, which was, of course, the armed forces. And which they discovered that Lipton's, the tea merchants, were bribing every quartermaster in the entirety of the British Army. And I don't just mean in Britain, I mean in India, I mean in Malta, I mean across the entirety of the British Empire. It was exposed and a colonel, a colonel, was sent to prison. Right? They didn't just punish the people at the bottom, which often happens in anti-corruption activity, they punished the people at the top, even the directors of Lipton's. As a result, during the First World War, when many other countries were struggling with the problem of contracts being handed out and by corruption being bought by bribes, Britain seems to have not struggled with that problem at all. We had the problem of capacity, deal enough shells, enough uniforms, enough men, but all countries struggle with that. So I think that the battle against commercial corruption actually helps us to understand why Britain managed to win the First World War. Now, in all those cases, this wasn't a systematic, it wasn't complete, and it was largely left many of the institutions of Britain untouched. And that's why I call it a conservative revolution. <laughs> And in many cases, what we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years, not in Scotland, of course, where, quite rightly, you abandon the whole thing and set up your own institution, which is probably the right idea. Perhaps calling it a parliament was where you went wrong. But the whole point being, of course, that in Britain, a lot of the aristocratic, a lot of the commercial, and a lot of the, the educational biases that were left in place in the institution of Britain are now causing the problems that we're suffering from today. I think it's interesting that you, you picked up there the sort of waves of anger that came from, quote, the people, unquote, that, mm. that led to that change. So um, I'm coming to, to, to audience questions very soon, so start thinking of them, because a short answer to this last one, then, and I'm, I'll, I'll start with, with, with you, Ellie, if I may. If we look back at that Victorian principle of the anger and the change, we're at a similar time of communities and society fundamentally changing. And we've talked about the perception um, against standards. We've talked about the reality of it. So, you know, if we look ahead, you know, what are the reforms that we need to, you know, the politician question is, how do I build back trust? But actually, I think it's a much wider one, that because in part it's about parliament, it's about politics, it's about institutions, it's about public service. So what are the sort of reforms and initiatives we need? And then the really challenging question, who's responsible for it? Go for it. Um, <laughs> uh, so one, th one caveat I might add before I start answering this question is, do you want to build back trust? So we've got... Um, yeah, do you want people to blindly trust politicians to do whatever they want and leave them to their own devices? Or do you, pe do you want people to be sceptical, question, challenge, engage? Um, so just because trust is very low, which you're seeing at the moment, doesn't mean that people actively distrust. Um, so very e easy example, um, you're a stranger to me. I've never met you before. I don't actively distrust you, but I probably also don't trust you. Sorry, don't, not you personally, but, right? <laughs> but, so I might be skeptical, right? I might be somewhere in the middle. And actually, it might just be that people, even though trust is really low, that they're not actively disengaging, that they're not actively um, starting to not follow rules to kind of break the social contract. They might actually be more active because they want to see a different government. They want to see different institutions. They might... Uh, yeah, get more involved in activism and voice their opinion, so, which is actually maybe quite healthy for a democracy. So that's just as a wee caveat, yeah. that, that's, that, that, that's something to think about. Um, but obviously, whether, you know, the, the, the semantics of it are one thing, but the actual, like, we have a problem um, because trust has gone down. That's still indicating of negative trends that, that we should look at. Um, so... One of the things, I, I would come back to those three categories that I named earlier, the econ economy, uh, culture, and political. And especially, again, coming back to the economy, um, as I said, the cost of living crisis and uh, public services, um, or like people's financial well-being and public services are, have seen a decline, and that has massively impacted people's trust in their politicians and in their politics. So actually, maybe don't focus on standards of public life, but actually focus on... Get, making people's lives better so people can start believing again that their children will be better off than they have been. And I think but that belief has kind of... are the individuals who offer to make it better. 
So well, that's the, that's what they've run on, right? That's yeah. that's what you think. That's why they got. That's why voters put their trust in them yeah. to to make those changes to make life better. Obviously, everybody has different ideas of what that looks like, but the general idea is that you, if you're more better off, and if your public services are working well, and you can you know see a doctor when you have an issue, um, I think most people would subscribe to that. As that that's my life having been made better. So focusing on those economic issues is actually really, really crucial, even though they might not directly relate to standards in public life yeah. um, as perceived. Um, again, cultural issues. So that's actually what we're from the John Smith Center are looking at. As you mentioned, we're really trying to get young people involved in politics and, and get people to not turn away. But even if they do, if they, even if they are really skeptical, still engage. Um, so for young people, especially, we're, we're offering a, a lot of development programs that um, especially for those young people who come from backgrounds that are not your typical politician that maybe has benefited from that patronage that we were talking about earlier. Uh, people from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, people of color, women, um, all of those, and we're really trying to get them involved. Um, and that's kind of, uh, like, obviously that's very specific, but as a cultural shift, mm -hmm. that would really help in getting people to feel like they're represented more, or to, to make that shift that people feel like they're, they're being seen and, and they're being listened to. Um, and a part of that as well is, I mean, we've mentioned social media, that I, I don't know where that's going to go, if regulation might be too late, but, you know, that's, it's something to look at. It's so important to see what, what are we doing with social media, with disinformation especially, um, and how, how we deal with that as a society. Um, and then obviously politics. Um, we've got, I mean, Labour uh, proposed slash promised um, the establishment of an Integrity and Ethics Commission uh, with independent advisors who can... Um, uh, uh, look at um, you know misbehaviour in Parliament without needing ministerial approval. Um, we need rules that, even if they're broken, which happens, have consequences. Yeah. That is one of the big things that, as I said earlier, people feel like politicians live by rules that don't apply to your average citizen, and they get away with breaking those rules without any major consequences. And that is, that is such a crucial point. And I don't know how that, I guess, you two might probably better be suited to, to talk about how we actually might implement that in, in practice. Um, but as an overall kind of philosophy that I would say politically is so important. So if those standards are broken, there are official consequences. So Philip, who's responsible? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. I think the, we elect politicians for purpose. So ultimately the lead has to come from the political class. I mean, I hear often enough in my specialism through the latter part of my career was around constitution devolution stuff, and how often did I hear nobody talks about this stuff on the doorstep? Yeah. Well, politicians, they, they, they take a lead on this yeah. stuff. So it is actually a question of statecraft, it seems to me, ultimately, that politicians, recognising where the public concerns are, recognising the problems in the country, are prepared to take a leap, an imaginative leap, into a different future, take that political risk, because they know it's the right thing to do. And it is risky. What militates against that, of course, is that the, the, the way that we run this country, uh, the executive power, sort of, fits in with your thesis in, but the executive power is pretty much untrammeled. If you've got a majority, talking about the South now mainly, but if you've got a majority in the House of Commons, you can do pretty much what you want. And that's what happened in the, in the Johnson time. Uh, we realised that Peter Hennessy, the great historian of, of the bureaucracies in the South, um, uh, had this phrase, uh, uh, the good chaps theory. And the good chaps theory basically said, in the UK, we don't have a written constitution. We have a lot of conventions, we've got a ways, and good chaps, and chaps is the opposite word and too often in this context, who will do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And we sort of got somebody come along who wasn't a good chap, mm -hmm. and he basically tested that theory, um, not quite to destruction, because as Ian has pointed out, the system did respond and dejected him, but not before he'd done a whole load of damage. But then you think, uh, so you pick up after he basically weakened a lot of the institutions that constrain executive power in this country, civil service, the judiciary, uh, the business community, all of those people who objected to this mission that he was on, which is a bit of an incohate mission, but that's in the story, um, were, were, were subject to, uh, uh, to a lot of abuse, to a lot of pressure to sort of pipe down. So he illustrated, in a way, that the, the, the structure of the way our system functions um, uh, allows that power to rest so, so heavily with the executive. The conundrum, of course, is that when you're not the executive, you think this is a very bad thing. 
But when you become the executive, oh, it's suddenly quite a good thing because I have the power. And I, don't, I can do what I want untrammeled pretty much by anything around me. Let me just illustrate that with one very simple point. I was responsible for uh, the second last attempt at House of Lords reform briefly. I mean, when I was a civil servant, not overall. Why, do, why is it when the House of Lords, we set off reforming it in a big way in 1911, why is it still that the House of Lords is this basically extraordinarily undemocratic institution with more members in it than any other um, uh, body in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the democratic and undemocratic world, bar the, the people's representative thingy, whatever it is in China. Why is it that this thing remains unreformed? Well, when you get close, it's a pain in the neck reforming. It's hard work, so you've got to per commit a lot of political capital. But when you're in power, you also is actually having a weak House of Lords that can't challenge the House of Commons. It's quite a good thing because it means that you get your legislation through just that little bit easier. And to use a patronage word, you've also got this... Pat well, you get, you've got this sort of secretary of state who's no use and you want to get rid of. And, you know, there could be a pain in the neck on the back benches, but you can dangle that little bit of patronage to get them into that, say, you get a peerage chum if you, if you pipe down. So it sort of suits the executive, the way that the system... And it works also, my other great bugbear, the first-past-the-pay system which, when you're out of power, looks what it is outrageously undemocratic. But when it works for you and you get into power with, what's the majority on the 32% um, of the vote, you sort of your enthusiasm for reform diminishes. So, just to conclude, it has to be led out of the political class. Absolutely. I would like to see far more public pressure on the political class, as there was in 1832 through the Chartist time, and indeed through many of the great changes as Ian has described in the Victorian time. I don't know why that's gone away. I would like to see that come back to put pressure on the political class. But ultimately, this is about statecraft that recognises, as some of the great politicians have done in the past, you go back to, to Peel, Gladstone, arguably Attlee and others, they've said, you know, the country's interest is here, my party interest may be here, but I'm going uh, to do this for the country's the better good of the country. And so that is the challenge, uh, it seems to me, to the political class as we that look to the future. On that point, I'm going to turn to the audience. <laughs> now it's your turn <laughs> to ask the questions, to put points. Um, there is a roving microphone, which will come to you if you put your hand up, and I will use my appallingly bad insight sight to, to, to highlight you out. This is being recorded, it is being broadcast, and in not just the spirit of this festival or indeed this parliament or indeed Scotland, but actually what we're talking about today, um, a certain level of courtesy I will expect and demand. So if you'd like to ask a question, pop your hand up. I'm going to start right at the front with the lady in the corner, just to be most problematic to the microphone, right next to the window. <coughs> and if you could give us your name, that would be helpful. <coughs> Moira Forrest. My question is, how can you codify um, professional standards in public life when the public assume that they are there, they are going to be adhered to, and they're not? And I think Ellie got, hit the nail on the head. Public are very disappointed when, when these standards are not applied in a professional way. Excellent. Maybe if we take a, a couple of questions and then I'll, I'll let the, the kind of, so the, that concept of how do we codify standards that can then not uh, lead to disappointment when they clearly fail to be adhered to. If you take the gentleman with the glasses. Sorry. So what do you do if your council doesn't play by the rules? Like, for instance, we've got a journalist which was just banned and the only people who are investigated by the council are the small parties. So big parties have taken over and they make, they're making up all the rules governing themselves. The lady in front with glasses or no, stop, yeah, stop, yes. Um, I think I'm about to name a name and get into trouble. Um, there, has, Sorry. there has recently been elected an MP for constituency beginning with the same letter and in that constituency he doesn't appear yet to have appeared very much and one suspects he may not but he is, albeit elected, a public servant on the public purse with a duty to fulfil. 
If he fails in that, how can we hold him accountable? Given that pause. also it would appear he has other earnings. <laughs> I will pause there, but we'll take the other questions. Um, any comments? Um, I mean, interestingly, I think the first and the last question about the codification, perhaps of the expectation um, upon politicians. Um, just, I was going to add this, um, Philip, you did, you know, Martin didn't come to me, but I, I was going to add this, that unfortunately, in a sense, the good chap thesis um, that Philip described, which Johnson proved uh, to have its limitations, so I need to point out that he wasn't the first. Think of what Anthony Eden did in, in Suez, uh, lying to the House. Um, unfortunately, in any system, rules will not solve the problem. Codification, we can write as many rules as we like, we can have as many standards as we like. They will not ultimately solve the problem. The problem is, how do we get people who are honest public servants who adhere to the Nolan standards in the first place? And I think by trying to regard um, public servants as some sort of like untrammeled beasts that need to be contained, you know, we're sort of like admitting defeat in the first place. What we need to do, of course, is to, as I say, allow people to uh, make people uh, reveal their um, interests far more thoroughly than they do at the first place. But most importantly, and I know what you're going to say, he would say this anyway, we need to educate our public servants. I know for a fact that certain members of uh, the new government have received the following training in terms of ethical standards expected of them. They've been sent a photocopy of the Nolan standards. That's the only training. Again, in most professions that most of you have worked in or working at the moment, would that be acceptable? We need to have proper training for public individuals. We need possibly even a professional standard that people have achieved. And of course, as part of that professional standard, we need to explain to people where the standards we enjoy today come from and how they compare to those of other countries. And that's not just politicians, that's also civil servants as well, and also local councillors as well. They need to be aware of the dangers and the consequences of what they're actually doing, which seems to be simply in the sake of expediency. If I get this done, it'll solve the problem. Yes, but it'll undermine the entire representative process in, 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 in that fashion. And, of course, if they fail to fulfil those standards, there ends up being some kind of recall system. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree, agree with a lot of that. I think the... Um, and I was part of this <laughs> through my working career, this sort of culture of amateurism, yeah. which is an inheritance it's from a, North Gutsch as it happens, from the Victorian times. So... Professionalism, I, um, again, with a little anecdote, but I'd say dealt with the Scottish referendum from Whitehall, dealt with devolution, and the, the, the understanding and knowledge amongst my colleagues in Whitehall of what was going on in Scotland was a little bit thin, should I put it <laughs> like that? So, and I, you know, try to work against that, but I don't think I entirely succeeded. So, professional, <laughs> and actually that should encompass the political class as well. If you want to be a politician, you should go through... An induction process is very you understand what's going on, but that should be to answer the question about codification should be underpinned by a very robust standard system, which which operates quickly and decisively when people go astray. At the moment, there is an alphabet soup of various institutions: the COVA, there's a, so there's the Committee on Standard Public Life, there's one or two others, there's the, the Prime Minister's advisor on standards, and all the rest of it. But it, it is it is opaque. And none of them have a statutory basis which allows them to operate outside of the political realm. So when Alex Allen, the, uh, the Prime Minister's advisor on standards in public life, says to the Prime Minister, I think Priti Patel was guilty of bullying, the Prime Minister is completely free to ignore that. Yeah. And so the system comes into disrepute. And it's one of the things that the incoming government has promised to fix, and let's hope it does so. But in doing that, it has to take itself... It is a diminution of ministerial, particularly prime ministerial power, because it'd be saying, this goes out of my control and I will have to deal with the consequences of it. So watch that space. A real test for the uh, incoming on. Let me just pick up the, um, the, well, let's call it the klaxon problem. Um, uh, one of the things, I'm a slightly sort of odd way of answering this question, 
But I think our democracy would have been rather healthier if UKIP, back in the day, had had a more proportionate representation uh, in the House of Commons, uh, proportionate to the vote that they got. Do you remember in the 2015 election, was it, they got 5 million votes, they got one MP. It's hardly surprising that people are saying, this is a system that does not work for us. Now, people say, well, why are you, you letting these folk into Parliament? They're sure this is a disgrace, well, all the rest of it. Hang on a minute, what's happening? The reason you're asking the question is because now there is some representation in Parliament, you are now getting the oxygen of publicity in a rather a good way, because people can see these people have to stand up, they have to be accountable to their constituents, they have to be accountable to the public. And I think one of the reasons that people have felt so disenfranchised is because we have a first-past-the-post system which effectively disenfranchises the vast majority of voters in this country. Your vote, if you're in a uh, constituency um, uh, uh, which is uh, a rock-solid Conservative or Labour or whatever, essentially doesn't. There's very few people actually have an influence at the time of an election. So uh, the, I think the answer to your, your, your issue about the behaviour of MPs High standards to which they have recall, which does happen. Yeah. Um, so you recall, you, George, Boris Johnson, the reason that he left Parliament essentially was he was subject to uh, a rec he was going to have to go through a by election, didn't want to face that. Um, uh, but the, the, the exposure of political ideas in the public realm so they can be challenged, I think, is hugely important. The, the chairman of Rump, May. Very um, short. <laughs> how long would they have to wait in order to seek a recall? if the individual fails adequately to serve his task. It doesn't... I mean, again, don't test me on the details. I think it went through my time yeah. looking at the Constitution. But it, it, it is... It, the process... If you're found in contempt of Parliament, essentially, the process is, is a reasonably rapid one. contempt? Um, well, Parliament if, itself. If, but if you don't do your work as a constituency MP... Yeah, well, ultimately, you, you say... This is if there's an actual breach of standards, then there is accountability there. For being a, a rubbish MP, ultimately, it, it is the people who elect them that have to be accountable. So you do get five years of being a rubbish MP if you're a rubbish MP. But that's the nature of democracy. Ali, do you want to say, just before I go back to the audience, I is there anything pretty much agree add? with the things that yeah. have been said, and just in the time, time, I'm happy to take Perfect. go to more questions. Now, there was a question from a, a lady in the middle of glasses there. Thanks. Um, this has been really interesting. Um, there's very lots of thoughts in my head, but one I... Uh, think I've decided to pick out is thinking about devolution of power and obviously it's power that links to corruption um, and why we need standards as a defence against corrupt acts or potentially corrupt acts but what happens when you devolve power without learning the lessons from the failures of institutions and the rules that are in place already and if we devolve power still further without devolving any better standards and rules and sanctions, especially given that long conversation we had about the demise of local media and the point the man behind me made, then are we asking for more trouble rather than learning and putting in place proper structures as we devolve? I guess I'm worried that we keep devolving and we keep devolving with hope, we devolved the problem, but not with, with that. You know, we, it, the Scottish Parliament was established. It was, it was going to be open and transparent and a lot more accountable. But there are no stat. There's no. Well, now that we have lobbying register, we do. But there are no. We've learned all of the same systems as Westminster. We haven't actually changed things except recall. Um, there was a question over from this side. I'll take a couple of the questions. So someone there was someone at the front. Gentleman in red there, just by on your right back. Um, just in general, is it right or would it be better if MPs weren't investigating or responsible for standards of MPs that changes of whether it's um, consequences, time periods that the lady was doing, but generally tightening everything up, wasn't in control of the people who they're trying to control? It makes no sense to me at all. Other mm -hmm. people like the police come for the IPCC and that sort of thing. You think of the church, would it not be better if an outside body mm -hmm. investigated some of the things going on in the church? They're all similar things to me, and I don't know how you'll ever get trust if it's the foxes policing the foxes, if you like. Excellent. And I think there's a lady at the back with glasses. 
Hi, yeah. Um, I fundamentally um, am concerned about the general debate question. Why have standards declined? Well, Noland is historic now. It's 30 year, nearly 30 years ago. And surely we should be asking why haven't, you know, have standards improved? And I think public standards may well have done. And what most of this discussion today has been about the political class. And there has been a real decline in the last the last previous UK administration, and it hasn't been policed by itself, um, waiting for the Tories to decide eventually that, you know, Boris has finally done enough damage is insufficient, and there should have been processes and systems in place, as the gentleman in front of me has just said, that deter determined that out with the political class. Ali, do you want to sort of comment on that, who polices the police? Um, Who, no, let's be accurate. Are the politicians right to look after the, themselves? I mean, the easy answer is no. I, you know, if, sorry, <laughs> um, like we said before, you know, if, if in a normal job, you would not judge your own behaviour. Like, that, someone else does that. Um, so I I'm, I'm absolutely agree that, yes, we need... Uh, procedures in place, and I've mentioned this earlier about independent advisors who can uh, investigate without ministerial um, approval, and we need way more of that in place, and kind of coming back to what Ian said around that system of patronage, that's what it was set up to do, but actually we need to move way more to a system that just works like a normal job, almost. Um, I've got a, a funny anecdote we did, um, we're doing a, a, a monthly kind of little poll in, in, in John Smith's uh, Centre newsletter, um, now, this is not representative, right? I'm just saying it's super not representative. Um, but we ask people if they think uh, politicians should uh, sit exams on the, the, the ministers should sit exams on the, the, the areas of public life that they represent. And a lot of people were for that. Uh, you know, and you could think about, like, for example, I sit a review every year about my objectives. What have I done? What have I, have I, have I done my job? Um, politicians, maybe you get that every five years, right? Like, so maybe you get tested by the public. Um, but, um, so yeah, definitely there should be independent advisors I don't, I don't, and independent governing bodies. I don't, I can't imagine how someone would say no, there shouldn't be, but that's maybe just my own, uh, my own bias. Um, I also want to come back to the question around devolution. Um, I kind of think you answered your own question, like, if, yeah, right? But yeah, that obviously we shouldn't replicate the system that I think we've all, we can agree. And I think there's definitely a lot of appetites in the public for, the system isn't quite working the way we would want it to be. Um, so in terms of devolution, which I do think, um, I'm biased, I'm from Germany, we have, we have 16 state parliaments, right? So I, I think devolution is a good idea in, in that regard. Um, but as you say, the, the, the standards need to come with it. We need to make sure that it works slightly or quite massively different than how uh, parliament works at the moment. But yeah, you, you, I think you've kind of answered your own question. <laughs> Ian, do you want to um, comment on this? Dare I say, the institutions you're talking about are those institutions I mentioned earlier that never were thoroughly reformed. Or rather, what happened is the new institutions as they were created, factory inspectors, police forces, various health organisations, publicly run health organisations. Um, we have to be careful, the word professionalism can imply bodies whose interest is in defending their reputation, right? Whereas I prefer this concept of the public service ethos. What's the purpose of these bodies? Um, these bodies we described, the church, the royal family, the um, corporation of the City of London, uh, Parliament. Uh, fundamentally, what they did, the trick they pulled, and the reason why they're still there and able to get away with it so long, is they created a simulcrum, uh, a sort of artificial version of um, self-regulation. Right? They made it look, they created the Ecclesiastical Commission, which is largely made up of, guess what, clergymen of the Church of England. Right? They created you know, various versions of standards committees and investigation committees, which is made up of parliamentarians. You know, who actually has the political courage to actually come in and regulate these bodies effectively? What we saw in the 19th century was, on the one hand, the creation of a very strong public service, ethical service orientated public orientated the teachers the the doctors not the doctors originally but the, perhaps the health inspectors the factory inspectors and alongside that many of these old institutions managed to disguise the, the fact that they hadn't reformed by creating these kind of almost fake versions of self-regulation and that's 
the chicken that's come home to roost, that we see the consequences of that. The fact that an awful... If a Victorian came back today and saw all the things that we've left unreformed since the 19th century, they'd say, why did we start? Look at all the things we did to remove the powers and influence of the Church of England, to remove the powers and influence of the House of Lords, to expand representation, to reduce commercial um, corruption... What have you been doing for the past 100 years? Why did you not finish the job? And unfortunately, of course, as long as we don't educate our children and our politicians about the true nature of our country and come up with rubbish about the envy of the world and the mother of parliaments, it's not going to change. Philip. Yeah, I, 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 to be a really uh, sort of very great questions, I think really important ones. And the devolution one is absolutely fundamental because, again, I encounter this so many times. How can you trust people? to hold power, or you haven't got the capability, haven't got the capacity, so we need to carry on doing it for them. And if you look at regional policy in England, is probably the best example of that. Every government over the last uh, four or five decades has come in a manifesto, oh, we will devolve uh, power to, uh, to local, to regions, to local authorities, hyper-devolution to local communities. And when they get into power, they start sucking the teeth because they fear that they will reap the consequences of failure. Um, because it's sort of a catch-22. So how do you devolve and build capacity at the same time? It's difficult. It requires political risk to do that, which why it doesn't happen enough. And you see, one of the problems with this parliament, it has sucked power upwards. It's taken power away from communities, and it needs to reverse that. But that requires risk-taking. And I think that answers the question the, 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 about the councils. It, ultimately, if you get this right, um, local actors... Feel that pressure locally, because if your bus time table doesn't work, your local school isn't performing, you are being held directly accountable for that, not just at election time. Absolutely agree, strong institutions. I would take all of this regulatory stuff out of the hands of the politicians and put it in. You've got to trust the independent folk then to do a good job, but shorthand. But let me just finish on this, this question of what's happened over the last little while. I think this is quite important. I pose this challenge myself. I mean, how do you explain? I think standards have stayed high. So what happened politically, particularly over the last five, six years? Well, I think you have to go back, I'm afraid, to the whole Brexit thing, where our system, which doesn't have those checks and balances, was exposed to this extraordinarily intense, vituperative and very bitter ideological divide between those who wanted to remain in the EU and those who didn't. Those who won the argument, because they persuaded people's country uh, that we should leave the EU, had no cohate vision for what that would mean. So when they get into power, this vision of what Brexit meant receded constantly in front of them. And what they were seeing is all of these institutions trying to undermine the will of the people. So they started to uh, essentially to attack those institutions because they felt these institutions were inhibiting uh, the expression of the will of the people. How often did you hear that said? And this took us into an era of British politics that was, was completely out of, of most people's comprehension <coughs> and experience, and it tested our institutions almost to destruction. I think the really interesting question, and the one I don't think any of us can answer, and was that an aberration? Will that poison come out of the body politic over the, over the next few years and we revert to something like the status quo ante? Or will the section of our body politic, in terms of some of the political parties, stay thurled to that will of the people, that quite destructive attitude, if you like, to the governance of the country so that this remains contested territory? What I don't think is going to happen, I think, sadly, is a, uh, out of this comes a big reform moment uh, akin to 1832 or to um, maybe to you know, you know, some other big, big reform moments that comes to experience um, where we take a very self reflective look at the way our politics, our infra democratic infrastructure functions and see, uh, is it fit for purpose? What can we learn from other parts of the world? Does this now require substantive reform? I'd love to see it happen, but I'm afraid I don't think we'll see it in the next uh, 15, 20 years. Now, thank you. Sadly, we have been beaten by time. Um, so I would like to thank the panellists for their contribution. I would like um, people to go away and just think what made you think during this, because that is important and it is what it's about. 
Maybe there will be a wave of anger that sees the change that's needed. Maybe there will be a generation of new politicians with different backgrounds that can es escape. Or maybe we can have people step up to the responsibility of offering their services to the public. And to do that, we will see. Um, can I remind you that the festival carries on? And interestingly, I, would, I was so tempted to go to the US and so many of the comments about what the future holds. There are other talks today, particularly on the US election at 3.15, um, and also making amends for empire at 3.30, again, something that, was, that, that has been hinted at. Um, there will be a physical survey at the door, which we would ask you to fill in partly to allow us to articulate what this festival looks like going forward. If you booked your ticket through Eventbrite, it will already be sitting in your inbox, so enjoy it. Um, and can I just finish off by thanking um, Ian Carwood, Philip Rycroft, and Dr. <laughs> for, for her work today. And I would hope if you join me in giving them a round of applause for their time. My penultimate thanks is going to be to our BSL <laughs> interpreters who've worked so hard at the site, and I thank you very much for that. And from the panel, can I thank you for coming to this. Please attend other elements of this festival, because the Politics Festival is a very, very important opportunity to contribute. And as a final little thing from the conveners, there is an elections bill travelling through the Scottish Parliament. If you would like to contribute ideas to it, be it on party political funding, be it on removing who controls. It is a vehicle that potentially will have that opportunity for you to do. Details can be found on the Scottish Parliament website. Have a lovely day and thank you so much for coming.